Are you searching for answers? Discover your true identity. Stay tuned to Shalom World. Welcome to Vital Signs, your prescription for a healthy family, where members of the Catholic Medical Association explore medical topics vital to the health of you and your family members. I'm Dr. Tom McGovern, the host of Vital Signs on Shalom World TV. Today, we're going to explore the topic of contraception and how it can affect the health of marriages and families. A woman's fertility is an integral and beautiful part of your humanity. Yet that gift is being seen by more and more people as something unwanted, unnecessary, or even unhealthy. Contraception has been practiced for millennia, but its use escalated in the 20th century, particularly with the release of the first birth control pill, Inovid, in 1960. The United Nations estimates that over 800 million women worldwide rely on some form of contraception, such as sterilization, male condoms, intrauterine devices, oral contraceptive pills, and long-acting injections or implants. What are the consequences of using such methods to treat pregnancy as a disease to be avoided? Well, they include infertility, blood clots, and certain cancers, a higher divorce rate, as well as a reduced marriage market. There are actually less men willing to get married these days than there are women. Joining us today as our medical expert is Dr. Chris Stroud. Chris is an obstetrician gynecologist who practices in Fort Wayne, Indiana, and specializes in the treatment of infertility. He applies methods known as natural procreative technology that he learned at the Pope Paul VI Institute in Omaha, Nebraska, after completing his residency training. Chris also delivers a lot of babies. Chris, welcome to Vital Signs. Well, Tom, thank you. It's nice to be with you and our friends at Shalom World TV. Chris, what do we mean by the term contraception? Yeah, good question. I mean, literally, that means to prevent conception, contra opposed to conception. So it prevents sperm and egg from meeting and thereby prevents conception. So when couples start using contraceptives, they have good intentions. What are those good intentions? Well, I would never uh, I would never say that I know their intentions. I think many couples do. Uh, but simply speaking, I'm, I think a couple uses contraception because they don't want to be pregnant and they want to be intimate on their own schedule. So using contraception allows the marital act, I think we can say sexual intimacy, to occur and, con and conception not to occur as part of that act. Therefore, it's contraception. Now, the church talks about contraception being against the good of the human person. And, and says we should say no to contraception. But when the church says no to something, she's usually saying yes to something better. What is that something better that we say yes to by saying no to contraception? You know, the, the couple that's contracepting is saying to one another figuratively, I want to give you my all in marriage. Uh, I want God to be in charge of my life, of my finances, of my work. Oh, but there's that one little thing that I'd like to keep control over. And I don't want to quite put that in God's realm. I'm going to keep my fertility separate. So they're saying no to being open to life and open to each other and open to fertility. Now, in your work as an obstetrician gynecologist, I assume that you've met some women who used contraceptives and became disenchanted with them. What are some of the reasons that women said that they decided to stop using contraceptives? 
It's a wide variety of uh, reasons, I think, that women and their spouses will decide that contracepting is no longer right for them. They could be biological, that is to say, maybe side effects from the medication, such as depression or mood swings, a de decreased libido or interest in intimacy. Those are very common in women who are particularly taking hormonal contraception. Uh, but then you know, it will not surprise our listeners and viewers that um, sometimes the couple just doesn't feel right as a couple. They feel like something is missing in their intimate lives. Uh, those are all very common things that I hear in my practice. Many contraceptives are hormones that are given, hormones that the woman's body doesn't need at that time. What are some of the specific medical, not relational, but medical uh, consequences that women report? Well, again, some of those side effects, we'll see women that will say their depression became worse or they became depressed when they started taking hormonal contraceptives. Uh, a lot of times we'll hear them say that their libido or their interest and in intimacy seems affected by taking it. Sometimes they'll notice vaginal dryness or irritation, uh, skin changes, hair changes. Those are all common consequences metabolically of taking artificial hormones. And what about serious side effects. I've heard that uh, hormonal contraceptives are supposedly a carcinogen. Is that true? Yeah, you're exactly right. Estrogen, synthetic estrogen is classified uh, as a carcinogen. Uh, but certainly, if you look carefully in the very, very small print in the package insert in the birth control pill packs, you'll see that pulmonary embolism and deep vein thrombosis, both life-threatening events, the woman's risk of breast cancer goes up remarkably during the years that she's taking artificial hormones. Um, so the risk of breast cancer, the risk of blood clot, those are all very real consequences um, to taking artificial hormones. And how common are those? Well, you know, they're very common to the women that experience them. <laughs> uh, <laughs> overall, if we look at the population, uh, Serious consequences of hormonal contraception, statistically speaking, are not terribly common, but then many of them go unreported and under-discussed. I mean, in my almost 29 years of practice, I don't think I've ever seen a woman who told me that her previous doctor shared with her that her risk of breast cancer may go up 10 times while she's taking artificial hormonal contraception. Yet it says it right in the package insert, but it's rarely, if ever, talked about. Wow. And, and, the, and oral contraceptives and hormonal contraceptives that are shots or implants, they don't only have unintended medical consequences, but they can affect relationships. Tell our viewers how husbands and wives might perceive each other differently when a woman is taking hormonal contraception. Well, that's a great question, Tom. Think about it from the contracepting couple's perspective. The man is essentially saying to his wife, I want to be intimate with you whenever I want, and I want there to be no consequences. That is to say, no chance of pregnancy. So I want what I want when I want it, and I want there to be no consequences. That sounds a lot like toddler logic, doesn't it? Um, <laughs> but that's exactly what the contracepting couple is saying to one another. And it, it allows the woman to really be objectified. I want you to be an object of pleasure with no consequence. That's separating out uh, a big part of what intimacy is. You know, the church in her wisdom teaches that it's for babies and for bonding. They're both equally important. When we carve one out that's part of the natural law, it creates consequences, and relationship consequences are very common. At one of our Catholic Medical Association national meetings, we heard an economist talk about societal effects of contraception through its effects on what's called the marriage market not only for faithful Catholic women, but all women now have a harder time finding a husband because of contraception. How does this make sense, Chris? You know, it's interesting. Again, if we think about it, uh, it's, it's allowing sort of sexual intimacy to become almost a market commodity in a way, because now it's no longer tied to a long-term, stable, loving relationship. Uh, it's a transaction, you might say. So it allows uh, a man, in this case, to be intimate with a woman uh, at will because there's no consequence of, of pregnancy as a result of that union. Uh, we've really taken the natural component of intimacy out and turned it in something to be traded on the market, so to speak. And from what I understand, there's more men willing to just have those kind of relationships with women instead of committing to a long-term relationship 
where many women, seeing the biological clock ticking, want to get married. And so there's an imbalance. You know, Chris, if couples have a serious reason to avoid pregnancy, what means are available that are both medically effective and morally sound? Absolutely, Tom. Great question. There, there are plenty of valid reasons for a couple not to want to achieve pregnancy. Uh, and they can use any of the many forms of natural family planning or NFP to achieve that. Uh, for instance, I use and recommend and promote uh, the Creighton Fertility Model. Uh, it's 99% effective at avoiding pregnancy. I'll bet a lot of our viewers would be surprised to learn that according to the CDC, birth control pills are only 90% effective at avoiding pregnancy. So if a couple doesn't want to achieve pregnancy, they can still be intimate at certain times in their cycle, not use an artificial contraception, uh, and achieve the goals that, that they want. How does a couple choose between the various methods of natural family planning? Yeah, that's a good question. I think in many cases, it has to do with what's available to them. Uh, you know, in many parishes, they may have a relationship with instructors in one method versus another method. Um, some of the NFP methods particularly lend themselves to when things are maybe not so normal. For instance, women with very irregular cycles, uh, the Creighton fertility model is very good with that. For women maybe who have just had a child and they're breastfeeding and they want to avoid pregnancy, I think it's known that the Marquette method is very popular uh, for helping couples in that situation. But there are great resources available for a couple. You can avoid pregnancy, follow church teaching and wisdom, um, and not use artificial hormones. There are so many different forms of contraception. What are the most common ones and, and how do they work? Sure, Tom. I think the most common method uh, and the oldest method probably since it came on the market in the 60s um, are birth control pills. And there's a variety of brands and types of birth control pills, but they're generally the same. The woman takes a pill every day. Uh, there's also what's called the ring, where a small plastic ring is placed in the vagina and it releases the hormone slowly over time. Uh, there's also the patch, which is a transdermal or a through the skin method of releasing hormones for contraception. And then there's also a few different types of IUDs or intrauterine devices. Some of those release hormones, some of them do not. But those are the major categories. So how do they prevent egg and sperm from coming together? Or is that the only way they work? Yeah, that's a great question. Again, like we referenced earlier in that very fine print and the package insert that's required by the FDA, our viewers can research that for themselves. Birth control pills and hormonal contraception in general works in three ways. One is it prevents ovulation or it prevents or inhibits an egg from being released from the ovary. The other way is that it affects cervical mucus. And uh, without too much of an anatomy lesson, that prevents the sperm from getting through the cervix into the uterus. And then the third way is it creates what's called a hostile uterine environment. It makes the lining of the uterus so very thin that if an egg were to be fertilized, it can't implant. But those are the three main, main mechanisms uh, that hormonal contraception works. But there's something else that happens, isn't there? Something that a lot of people don't want to advertise and that many people are shocked to learn. Yeah, that idea that sounds pretty benign, a hostile uterine environment. Uh, think about what that means. If a sperm fertilizes an egg, we know and our viewers know that a child is created. That pregnancy has to travel down the fallopian tube for about 10 days and then land in the uterus and implant. If the environment of the uterus is hostile, the company's words, not mine, that it can't implant in the lining of the uterus, it's lost. Well, a sperm that's fertilized an egg now has an embryo, that's a child. If that child is lost because of something we did to the inside of the uterus, that's called an abortion. Uh, so for instance, the Paragard IUD, the Paragard IUD has no hormones. It only has copper. So it doesn't prevent ovulation. It says in its literature that it, it inhibits sperm transport into the uterus, and then it creates this hostile uterine environment. So the listener and, and the viewer has to say, what percentage of the time am I comfortable using a method that could lead to an abortion? Every time, maybe not. 
but any time greater than zero, are you comfortable with that? Because at some point, at some percentage of the time, that method is causing an abortion. That's something that doesn't get talked about that our viewers need to know about. Chris, do you have any memorable responses you have heard from patients when revealing such information to them? You know, I think often when I'm sharing that, maybe at a talk or at a conference or sometimes in the exam room with a patient, I think it takes people a little bit of time to sort of wrap their brain around that uh, because it, it isn't talked about. I would venture to say that no OBGYN that's prescribed oral contraceptives has ever said to a young woman, by the way, there's a chance this will lead to an abortion that you never know about. And that's sad. That's another whole topic of informed consent. But so when I'm sharing that with people, it's shocking. Uh, they haven't heard that in the slick advertisements. They haven't read that in the magazine ads. And it takes some time to sort of wrap your brain around. But many, many times in my practice, I've had couples come back to me afterwards and say, we really had no idea if we were on the fence, we're off the fence. We don't want to use these methods to prevent pregnancy again. And they immediately become natural family planning advocates. Chris, what final comments about contraception do you have for our viewers? Yeah, please know you never have to choose between your faith and your fertility. So if it is on your heart to avoid pregnancy, you can do that. You don't have to take dangerous, cancer-causing hormones. You don't have to go against Mother Church's teachings, and you don't have to abstain from intimacy all of the time. Uh, so get in touch with someone at your local parish uh, or online uh, that teaches a form of natural family planning. You can learn that and be successful with that, I promise. Chris, doctors like you are doing the world a whole lot of good. Thanks, Chris, for being with us for this episode of Vital Signs. And thank you to our viewers for watching this episode of Vital Signs, your prescription for a healthy family brought to you by the Catholic Medical Association on Shalom World TV. Please join us for our next episode and share the good news of Vital Signs with a friend. And may God bless you. I encourage everyone to send us emails with questions that you want to ask medical experts please email us at vitalsigns at shalomworld.org. Your questions and comments will help us determine what topics we'll cover in the next season of Vital Signs. use media a lot in evangelization. So I believe in the importance of Catholic radio, Catholic TV, Catholics using the new media. Can I encourage everyone to watch Shalom TV? I think it's a great vehicle of evangelization. And God bless all of you.